Hey everyone, this is John Buck, uh, back with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and this video is a companion to the First Order Systems video. So if you haven't watched the video on the background information, theoretical information about First Order Systems, uh, uh, pause this video, go back and look at that one. Uh, but in this one, I'm just going to carry that, those examples on and show you some, some results uh, of simulating those systems with MATLAB and, and talk about how the choice of A changes the behavior of the system. And also, uh, as I uh, look at different values of A, how the time domain behavior and the frequency domain behavior are connected. Uh, so let's switch over to the, uh, the whiteboard for that. Here we have a, a sort of side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, the the uh, left-hand column is the time domain. Uh, the right-hand column is the frequency domain. And actually, I'm going to uh, I can make this a little bigger, and then we're just going to worry about two of these at a time, because it's actually sort of set up to be like that. Uh, maybe even a little bigger. So if I look in the time domain, this shows for uh, four different values of A. Uh, the red line is A is a half. Uh, a is 0.75 for the black line, and A is 0.9, so getting larger for the blue line. All three of them, remember we saw th th that this is the impulse response. H of N would be A to the N U of N for this. All right, so they all start here, but when A is small, A to the N, like for a half, this dies off relatively quickly. So we can see the red line going away faster. The black version is a little bigger, a little closer to one that dies off more slowly, but it does eventually ramp down. And then the 0.9 version also ramps down. I've just plotted the first 50 samples here uh, for this case. So we can see that, that the closer A is to 1, the more slowly it dies off, which means if, if I think about convolving with this, it's going to uh, wait the more recent, after I flip this and shift it, right? it's going to wait the current values more and forget more about the distant past. But, but sort of, so it's going to be kind of like an average, but a weighted average where I weight the recent things more. And if I scroll across to look at the frequency domain, I do see that kind of behavior. I've now got the, and this thing, it's the same three choices of A. Uh, and this is the, the frequency axis going from minus pi to pi. It's normalized by pi. And I'll make this just a little bit smaller. Um, and we can see uh, this behavior that, that the, uh, the, the smaller A is, the smaller values of A have a much broader filter here, right? It's lower gain, but it, it's a broader filter. And, and that makes sense because we've seen that omega equals zero, the, uh, the value of the Fourier transform at omega equals zero is the sum of the signal in time. And since the red one dies off fastest, it clearly has the smallest sum. Though if I wanted to, if the, that gain were important, I could scale these all to have the same gain. The main thing to, to take away from this, though, is, is that as A, right, as A gets smaller, what we see is that H of N decays faster. But relative to its peak value, as A goes smaller, the, uh, the frequency response gets relatively wider. Right, so, or, or equivalently, if I go in the other direction, as A gets close to 1, the closer A gets to 1, the slower it is to die off, the more narrow band, the tighter the bandwidth of this filter is. If I think about, compared to where it starts to when it's down to about 3 dB of its original value, um, the the uh, the one with 0.9 is the much is the sharpest filter, and we'll see that behavior repeated. So these are all for positive values of a. I mentioned in the earlier video what happens at negative values of a is important too. If I look in the bottom row, these are all negative values of a. So now I have minus a half, minus three quarters, and minus 0.9. And we see the kind of behavior we expect from exponentials with negative signs is that they alternate. They hop up and positive, negative, positive, negative, but even while they're going back and forth, we see the same general behavior we saw in the top one, that the one with these, the magnitude of A is smallest, so the minus a half, the one that's furthest from minus one or closest to zero, dies off the fastest. The black one's in the middle, and the blue one at minus 0.9 dies off the slowest. And what happens by switching this A, if I go look at the frequency response, is I've shifted the peak. This is saying instead of having the peak uh, gain, the peak frequency response around zero, I've shifted it to pi, right? Remember the frequency response is periodic every two pi. And so what's going on here, this is minus pi to pi, and then it would just repeat again. I'd like tile this on the page. So this is showing the passband of these, these non-ideal filters that, that when A is less than zero here, I get, this is a non-ideal, but it is a high pass filter. 
or I, sh I should have labeled the one above, this is a, a, a you know, approximate or non-ideal low-pass filter. But if I put a signal through this, it's going to remove the high frequencies, and, right? And it's going to have more gain on the low frequencies than the high frequencies, because all of these die off as I move away from omega equals zero, which is the low frequency. Right? Whereas if I go down here, I see the stuff around omega equals zero has less gain than the stuff around pi or minus pi, and those are the high frequencies. So by having a first order system with a negative value of alpha or a, as it, the, the impulse response has this alternating behavior, turns it into a high pass filter, and that lets us keep high, if, we, if we're interested in keeping high frequencies and removing low frequencies, this would be a good, uh, a simple choice to use. It's, again, very much not an ideal filter, but as I said in the intro, sometimes you don't need an ideal filter. And the nice property of this, if we think back to the difference equation, right, if I solve that difference equation for y of n, I'd have that it was a times y of n minus 1 plus x of n. To implement this filter, I just need to do one, I take the old value, multiply it by a, and add x of n. So that's very little work. That's one multiply and one add to find the next value of y of n, as opposed to if I did something that was convolving with even a, a modest size filter, maybe with, with 7 or 14 points, if I was doing weekly or biweekly averages, that would be 14 multiply adds, depending on how I implemented the filter, right? Or at least 14, 14 adds followed by one multiply if I were clever about it. But either one is going to be more work than this. So if this filter is good enough, part of part of, important part of engineering is looking and saying, if this filter is good enough, I don't need that fancy filter. Other times I might, if I might need a very sharp, near the ideal filter, I got to pay the cost in time or power to do that convolution. But if I just need some crude filtering, some basic filtering, maybe I should think about a first order system, either if, if I just need some basic low pass or high pass filtering. All right, I'll stop here. And uh, the next video will be about second order systems.